Welcome to Protecting the Planet. I'm Ben Tracy. In this episode, we bring you stories about water and our relationship with this precious natural resource. We'll take you to California, where water from produce is being recycled. And we'll travel to Palau, a country in the Western Pacific north of Australia, where they've banned commercial fishing in 80% of their waters. But we begin with a story closer to home, along the coastlines of the United States. Research shows sea levels have risen 8 to 9 inches since the year 1880, destroying homes from California to North Carolina. And scientists say the threat will continue to grow. Well, you have a beautiful view here. Yep, that's the Atlantic Ocean right there. 30 years ago, Jim Hartshorn looked down at this endless expanse of blue water and decided North Carolina's outer banks felt like home. When you first bought here back in 1993, did you worry about sea level rise? Was that even in your thought process? I didn't think it would happen quite as quickly as what it did. I thought it wouldn't happen in my lifetime and let the kids worry about it, but, uh, but I've, I've had to worry about it here the last 10 years. The ocean has become an increasingly greedy neighbor. Storms are more frequent and more fierce. Parts of these barrier islands, which look a bit like a kid trying to trace the coastline, have retreated more than 200 feet in the last two decades. Some beaches are now losing about 13 feet a year. This past summer, video of the Atlantic claiming yet another beach house just up the road from Jim Hartshorn went viral on Twitter. You've got to take the good with the bad. It's wonderful to be out here. It's, it's pretty, but you have to know that the ocean's coming for you. So the water used to come under your house sometimes? Yes, uh, at high tide. He's trying to delay that day by reinforcing the pilings that hold up his house and rebuilding this staircase. The old one washed away during a recent storm. So this year alone, how much have you spent repairing storm damage? Approximately $20,000, $22,000 for storm damage. That's real money. Oh yeah, that's real money, yep. Hertzhorn and his neighbors are getting help from North Carolina's Dare County, which is spending $25 million to widen 12 miles of coastline along the Outer Banks. A few months ago, waves were hitting his pilings. Now he has a six-foot-tall dune and a few hundred feet of new beach. So you got some nice protection here now. Yep, we really do. The county also spent $155 million to build this bridge over the water, because Highway 12, the only way in and out, kept flooding. Years ago, the historic Cape Hatteras Lighthouse was moved nearly 3,000 feet inland, an ironic warning of the dramatic, climatic changes to come. You're not going to stop the ocean. You're not going to completely engineer your way out of this challenge. We will have to think about how we move infrastructure, how we move people. Reed Corbett runs the Coastal Studies Institute on the Outer Banks. Yes, sea level has changed in our past, but it's changing at a rate that we haven't seen before. He took us out to the marsh where he and other scientists collect soil samples that are a peak into the past. The soil basically gives you a history of what this marsh has done. He says their research shows the rate of sea level rise here has doubled in the past 100 years. That's a pretty aggressive acceleration. Yeah, and we're just starting to see the ramp. You know, we're looking at a foot rise in the next 30 years. That's gonna impact most homeowners on the Outer Banks during their mortgage. And so it's not about putting it off to the next generation. It's happening today. We're seeing those impacts today. Sea level rise is accelerating due to global warming, caused mainly by the burning of fossil fuels. It's causing the world's ice sheets and glaciers to melt. A new NASA report says sea levels along U.S. coastlines are expected to rise as much as 12 inches by 2050, with the southeast and Gulf Coast seeing the most change. By 2100, 13 million Americans could be displaced and $1 trillion worth of property inundated. East Coast cities such as Miami are already struggling with flooding, even on sunny days, and hurricanes and storm surge along the Gulf Coast are expected to get more intense. So the intent here is to provide multiple lines of defense. We're going to build from this line out. Kelly Burks-Copes is with the Army Corps of Engineers in Galveston, Texas. 
It's planning to build a system of massive gates here designed to fend off 22 feet of storm surge and 43 miles of sand dunes to protect against rising seas and stronger hurricanes. The project is estimated to cost $31 billion. It will be the largest infrastructure project in the nation for the next 20 years. Is this where we're at with climate change, that we have to do things like this? I think that it's a necessity. If we're going to continue to live close to the ocean, if we want to live here on the coast, then we have to provide a level of defense. This is where your home was? And I have the address to prove it. Oh, man. OK. <laughs> right here. Right here. A whole house. Not even room for a toilet now. Jane Tolini thought she had it made. So, so you can see this where was I your was. house here. Yeah. Living so high above the Pacific the on the here. cliffs of Pacifica, California. There was a 20-foot front yard, a 900-square-foot house. Then there was like maybe 25, 30 feet until you came to this white picket fence in the backyard. And it felt like I could get drunk, roll out the door, hit the fence, and I would be safe. I thought I was golden. She was wrong. Punishing El Nino storms in 1998 turned her California dream home into a nightmare. She woke up one morning to find her yard was gone. There was not a nothing zip, <laughs> and it was terrifying. Now, if somehow this idiot had gotten up, walked to that sliding glass door, opened it, and stepped out, I would have stepped into space. You would have fallen right out of your house? Right out of my house. That's how undercut I was. Here's the house, here's the land. I mean, it was like, how did this happen? And so quickly, and I slept through most of it. That morning, she called friends to help her quickly move out before her house and 12 others had to be torn down and pushed into the ocean. Since then, entire apartment complexes have realized that they, too, picked a losing fight with the Pacific. Of course, erosion has always been a part of life on the West Coast, but scientists say climate change is accelerating it, threatening nearly all of California's 1,000 miles of coastline and billions of dollars worth of real estate. If you believe there's going to be more water, then there's going to be less land on every coast around the world. And having lived on the leading edge of climate change, Tallini has no doubts about who has the upper hand. Mother Nature's always going to win. And she has got a bone to pick with the human race, and I don't blame her. Coming up, harvesting water from tomatoes. Welcome back. A raw tomato is 95% water. When used for products like tomato paste, all that H2O typically goes down the drain. But one company found a way to turn that wastewater into drinking water. Elizabeth Kling, a former reporter for CBS station KOVR in Sacramento, has more. Truck by truck, they roll in for 90 days straight. More than a million tons of tomatoes from California fields. Usually, they're turned into products like tomato paste for use in ketchup and sauces. But at this facility in Merced County, they're tapping into something else hidden inside, fresh drinking water. Inside these pipes, tomato juice is being transformed into tomato paste. The leftover liquid is sent on to this shipping container where the water making magic unfolds. This is the WHU or the water harvesting unit because that's really what we're doing is harvesting the water from the raw tomato. And there's plenty to harvest. A raw tomato is about 95% water. This unit filters and cleans it to drink. People ask me in the elevator, what do you do? And I say, I grow water. Terry Paul's company, Botanical Water, is behind the technology. We harvest the water that naturally occurs in fruit and vegetables. It's a byproduct. It's thrown away. So what we do is we cleverly catch that evaporative condensate and then we run it through our purification process. Now he's trying to introduce the botanical water process to the rest of the world. California's Ingomar packing is the first to test it out in the U.S. 
What used to be discarded as wastewater is now cleaned and stored in tanks to be sent to local areas in need. What we're doing here today is a very small drop in the bucket, but for us, it's a way, a step forward, you know, represents forward thinking. The water harvesting units aren't cheap at about a million dollars apiece. But Ingomar says the return on investment is about more than money. What we're hoping for is to expand our footprint here with this technology and hopefully uh, start a trend in you know, facilities like ourselves around the world where the, you know, this really potential is just untapped right now. Growing the possibilities to provide a precious resource for years to come. Our goal ultimately is to positively impact 100 million for the world's poorest people, the world's most vulnerable people by 2025. We head now to Palau, a small chain of islands in the Pacific Ocean. The country's former president fought to reduce commercial fishing in four-fifths of Palau's waters to protect marine life. But the new president has a different idea. He wants to expand the fishable waters to boost the economy. Lee Cowan takes a dip into both sides of the debate. For the islanders of Palau, <laughs> climate change is hardly a new idea. For thousands of years, their ancestors have been carefully managing their most precious natural gift, their ocean. The turquoise waters in the maze that are the rock islands are pristine, almost as if man had never been here before. Palauans call it the nest of life. The waters here are teeming with more than 1,500 species of fish, more than 700 species of coral. There's so much to look at, it's pretty easy to get lost in all the dazzling display. Oh, it's unbelievable. Where's the boat? <laughs> the person with our boat is none other than the former president of Palau, Tommy Remigasau Jr., who did, in fact, come back for us. We are in an area where uh, absolutely no commercial fishing whatsoever. Nothing? No. In his first term in 2006, he joined with other Micronesian nations and banned commercial fishing and drilling across 30% of Palau's waters. That was a start, but Remigasau wanted more. He grew up in these waters. As a boy, he'd actually swim inside some of the region's most famous underwater residents. Palau's giant clams. We would climb inside the, the giant clam. Inside the clam? Inside the clam. And these old uh, clams would not, wouldn't be able to close all the way. <laughs> so you're kind of safe in a way. <laughs> when he was re-elected in 2015, he set about what would become his legacy. He argued for a full 80% closure of Palau's waters. That's an area bigger than the state of California. If you're concerned about the welfare of the people, if you're concerned about maintaining the population of the marine resources, then you have to do something drastic. In 2020, the Palau National Marine Sanctuary finally became one of the largest protected marine areas in the world. It doesn't matter where you live. Uh, you are either a part of the problem or part of the solution. But the sanctuary's future is now uncertain. Palau's current president, Sarango Whips Jr., is considering reducing the size of the protected area in an effort to jumpstart Palau's local economy. It makes it challenging because when I talk to my friends in the Pacific about closing off large areas, they're like, well, what, what's going to happen to the revenue that we're currently getting? When the foreign fishing fleet left Palau, it took with it a lot of jobs. But since there's no domestic fishing fleet here, that meant it also removed the source of tuna from much of the local market. When you go too far in one direction, what do you think happens? They revolt and they want to get rid of everything. That's not what we're doing. We're trying to optimize and actually improve and make it better. That's welcome news to fisherman Jackson Narinas. I think the intent of the law also was to develop the uh, local fishing industry, people like me. He says it cost him as much as $15,000 to fuel up just one of his boats. But he says the 20% where he is allowed to fish isn't actually where the fish are. There's no fish here. Come and visit, 
Whip says it's not about percentages. It's about finding the sustainable balance between protection and production. So essentially what you're saying is bigger isn't necessarily better. Right. So it's about replacing what's lost to make sure that that resource that we're protecting still has a benefit back to the people. Former President Tommy Remigasau doesn't buy that economic argument. To him, that sounds a lot like the foreign fishing lobby casting its political net just to get back in the market. It's not like we're dying because of lack of fishing revenue. We more than can make up for it. But whatever happens, he says at least the debate has focused attention on Palau, which for generations has been doing more to protect the world's oceans than countries thousands of times its size. We're happy that people take notice of what Palau is doing, but that's the idea. Take notice and do something. Up next, a controversy over a thirsty crop grown in Arizona being used to feed cattle in the Middle East. In a hotter and drier world thanks to climate change, Arizona is increasingly worried about its water supply. And some in the state are upset that farms with ties to Saudi Arabia are using up precious groundwater. We got a firsthand look at what Arizona's attorney general says is a scandal in her state. This was your well. This was my well. And now you got nothing. Nothing but dust. Arizona cattle rancher Brad Mead says his well went dry. You can toss a rock in and it's, it's, it's gone. Because of his neighbor's farm down the road. It's run by Fondamonte, owned by one of the largest dairy companies in Saudi Arabia. It grows alfalfa here to feed cattle back in the Middle East. It's illegal to grow it in Saudi Arabia because it uses so much water. So when you look out there and you see all that green, what do you think? I see uh, money leaving America. I see water getting depleted. It's pure insanity. Arizona Attorney General Chris Mays, a Democrat, says Fondamonte bought vast tracts of land in western Arizona where there are no regulations on how much water can be pumped out of the ground, so the state doesn't monitor it. Fondamonte also leases thousands of acres from the state itself, deals approved by state officials no longer in office. Fondamonte pays nothing for the water itself. We cannot afford to give our water away, frankly, to anyone, let alone the Saudis, for free. As we talked, we saw a series of trucks hauling dried alfalfa off of one of the state-owned properties. So cows in Saudi Arabia are essentially drinking Arizona water. Correct. The scale of the problem is obvious from above. I mean, that is a lot of green down there. Using millions upon millions of gallons of uh, precious groundwater. Mays says Arizona's cities, including Phoenix, will need that water as they face potentially drastic cuts from the drought-ravaged Colorado River. Fondamonte declined our request for an interview. What it's doing here is not illegal, but Mays wants the leases on state land canceled, and Arizona's legislature is now considering a ban on foreign-owned farms. It is a scandal that the state of Arizona allowed this to happen. It shouldn't be happening and it needs to come to an end. For more stories like these and live coverage of breaking news 24-7, stream us right here on CBS News, available across all platforms. Thanks for watching Protecting the Planet. I'm Ben Tracy.